everybody it's the best tuesday of all because stacy cross is here with us to talk about the starch solution and so if you have any questions go ahead and start post those in as well as what the heck is the weather doing where you are because it's freezing cold it got to 28 degrees last night and i haven't been wearing a coat yet mm -mm. So she had to wear a coat taking her walk today which today, was today during the day i had to wear a coat it's crazy <laughs> so i don't know about where you guys are it seems like there's like these 30 degree drops during from one time of the day or the other it's crazy i have feelings about them i'm sure you can tell <laughs> <laughs> i want every i guess i need to live on a tropical island where it's like 70 degrees all the time how is it where you are stacy it's cold but for me you know i'm in texas you guys so perspective um, so we get up past 100 during the summer for many weeks on end. Sometimes it's months. And now it's 40s, 30s and 40s in the morning. And then it heats up to like mid to high 50s in the afternoon, low 60s, which is nice. The afternoon is great, but the morning it's so, so cold. Yeah. Well, and it's like usually I start my walk if I'm taking my walk by myself and not with the dog. Like, so I like have a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt, a sweatshirt, and another coat. And then by the time I'm home, I'm at least down to the long sleeve sweat, long sleeve shirt. So, and you run. So do you end up layering yourself up too? Yeah, that's the hardest part is that I go out, when I go out, it's very cold. It's in the thirties. And so I'll have, I wear um, socks on my hands so that my hands stay together, like almost like mittens and long sleeves and sometimes a jacket, like a windbreaker type of thing and then leggings. And then the windbreaker comes off at some point and the headband and the gloves come off. But yeah, I, I mean, I get really, really sweaty because once you're out there for 15 minutes, it's not, you know, it's yeah. not very cold anymore. Nice and warmed up. So Stacy, if there's some people who don't know you other than underneath you, it literally says McDougal support specialist. So Stacy is, I was about to say was, but you still are our health support specialist from the July 12 day program that we took. And I, I know everybody loves having you on and I love having you on too. Um, because you get to answer all these little details for us and you're so helpful and you have so much experience doing all of this. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like to say to introduce sure. yourself? Yeah. So yes, like Kathy said, I work for the McDougal program. Love, 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 love my job. We get to see people get better all the time. Um, Primarily the McDougal program, it's a medically supervised dietary intervention for chronic illnesses. So we get a lot of people with diabetes, heart disease, um, autoimmune illnesses, all kinds of stuff come in and come through the program. And we put them on a starch centered diet um, free of animal products and oils. And we get to see their numbers improve, their biometric numbers. We get to see their their lives improve. You know, they very, very quickly will have um, relief from symptoms that have been plaguing them for sometimes years, decades. And so it's really fun. Lots of, lots of good stuff goes on there. Um, in addition to that, I'm a mom of four boys. And so my house is ruckus fun all the time. And um, I'm a registered nurse, so my background is in nursing. I used to work for the American Cancer Society. I used to work for a pediatrician's office. Um, and so I have background in lots of different things, but um, this is by far my favorite, favorite job that I've ever had. Um, like I said, because people are getting well and are getting to see their, their illnesses reversed. Um, I think that's about it. That's all there is to me. Oh, I have a husband, Stan. <laughs> Shout out. I don't know if he's yeah. here today. Stan, but... Stan was here last time because you told he us. Was. Stan was, was like, I didn't even tell him. I don't think I told him I was doing this today. Whoops. I'm terrible. So he's probably not here, but he'll watch the recording. And then my boys will sometimes put the recording on on YouTube later. Oh. <laughs> If they're on the couch and eat their snacks while they watch mom. It's really funny. So oh, I always 
I can. <laughs> They're like, mom's a YouTube star. Yeah, exactly. They think that's so cool. So that's thanks awesome. for making me cool and relevant to my teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to help. <laughs> I just, it's also funny. And maybe I shouldn't say this since they'll be in the case they're watching it, but they are kind of hanging out with a bunch of middle aged ladies. <laughs> no shame in their game. They see no problem with it at all whatsoever. They love it. <laughs> That's awesome. They're like, I bet those ladies will give us treats. And they are right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hear that lady cooks and bakes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one question. So you guys, as you come in, if you have questions about the starch solution, if you have questions for Stacy, um, if you're asking about spe specific health conditions, we may ask some more questions. Um, also down in the notes. And if you're on the email list, I sent a thing out where you can get all the free information about the McDougal program. The 12 day program is not free, but the next one is in January. I know a few of you have already signed up and we're excited for you because it's, mm -hmm. we were excited to do it in July. Well, Cheryl wasn't so excited then got excited. Let's be real, <laughs> right? We all know that story. So Janice um, says, as she doesn't usually catch the live, so she thought she would ask about cacao powder. And she said, I thought Kathy said something about it not being McDougal friendly. Is that right? I said, he does not like you to have chocolate. So, but I'm going to let you answer about maybe chocolate and cacao and cocoa powder all together, you think? I'll do my best. I I don't remember what the difference between cacao and cocoa powder. Do you, it's Kathy, pretty much the same thing. Nutritionally, it's it's the same okay. thing. Same thing. Okay. So um, so cacao powder or cocoa powder is similar to these peanut butter powders that are out right now, like the PB two, PB fit, those types of things. And what they are is they're um, defatted nut or bean so in the case of the cacao powder cocoa powder that's the um cocoa bean that's been processed and i think most of the fat has been taken out and it's been dried and all that stuff and now it's a powder it is okay to use for baking and cooking um cooking probably just baking um a little chili i put some in my chili mm -hmm. okay okay good yeah so, sauce. Yes. yeah or baking or whatever you want to do with it it's it's fine to use in small quantities but just like the peanut butter powder that i mentioned there is still fat in it and it still is a calorie dense item meaning if you were to use just a lot of it or use it so frequently um like several times a day it does add calories and the problem with it because it of the way that it's processed is that it doesn't add satiety really at all um so it's calorie dense so you would use it just like you would any other condiment um just sparingly you know in food but yeah no it's it's totally fine i see someone said they're they use like a couple tablespoons in um in a in a smoothie and, maybe and doctor so she was saying i put it in her doc her dr golder smoothies i don't know if you've heard of her she does hype they're not the same kind of high calorie smoothies as some of the others where you use like a pound of power greens, like, which is a lot. It's like half of one of those Costco containers in one right. smoothie. Um, usually it's a, less than a cup of frozen fruit. And she said she's adding three tablespoons of cacao almost every day. That seems like a lot of cacao powder for a smoothie to me. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need much of it. I mean, usually anytime I've added it to something, I've probably only used a tablespoon because it's very chocolatey when you use that amount. So, and just because I know, I was doing some of the Dr. Goldner smoothies before. So like, just to give you an idea. So like literally you put greens in and you press, and this is a Vitamix container where you press it down, you fill it up and press it again until it's here. So all of that's greens. 
You might use a half to one banana and a half a cup of berries to make it palatable. Similar to the way in the McDougal program, we use a little salt or a little sugar to make something palatable because obviously that many greens is not super palatable. <laughs> and um, she also uses some flaxseed. And then this is something that you don't just suck right down, but it's kind of your thing for the day. Now it's not, McDougal is not a smoothie sort of situation. But just to give you, Stacy, an idea of, so, so, so I could see using a tablespoon to a tablespoon and a half in here. And with all those greens, you may not be able to still taste it because that's, it's a significant amount of bitterness. But like if I'm Got making it. a big six quart slow cooker full of chili, I only, I wouldn't use more than two tablespoons of cacao powder or cocoa powder in there. Okay, so um, what is the purpose? Just tell me real quickly, why are people making these super packed with okay. green smoothies? So Dr. Brooke Goldner is a different yes. doctor who is a whole food plant-based doctor who's doing a different thing. But I also believe that she is a psychiatrist, but I believe she cured her lupus. So it's a hyper-nourishing diet, mostly raw. Um, she does, I believe, use some flaxseed oil, which I know would be counter, what is the word counter indicative of McDougal? So there's some things you could do huh. side by side, some things you couldn't like. There's, I think you do end up doing a few tablespoons of flaxseed, ground flaxseed a day, which Dr. McDougal probably would, it's high calorie density. And it's for people who are trying to help themselves with autoimmune disease. Got it's it. usually what's happening. Okay. Ooh, all right. Mm, and you're getting I a little bit okay. into the neighborhood I feel a little uncomfortable with, which is this. Um, so our approach to autoimmune illnesses is different from hers. And okay. um, that's not to say that what she's doing isn't fantastic and great. But this is a, this, I'm just going to speak more to like a broader global issue, which is that there are so many different, wonderful plant-based doctors out there doing things differently. And you may have fantastic results with Dr. Furman, and you may have fantastic results with Dr. Esselstyn, and you may have fantastic results with Dr. McDougall, for sure. But the times that I see people not get good results is when they're trying to mix a bunch of different things together um, that, like you were saying, they're counterproductive sometimes. So if you're making a massive, gigantic smoothie that's mostly greens and it has some berries and a little flax, and that's what you're doing to try to combat your um, autoimmune illness, that's fine. That's your choice. But that is not McDougaling. McDougaling is a starch-centered diet, and none of that stuff is starch. So, um, so we don't do smoothies. It's not. It's not that we are saying you can't have a smoothie. It's that smoothies are not a part of the protocol of the program that we prescribe our patients. Mm -hmm. So, for for example, in an in the case of an autoimmune illness, we would put you on the same McDougal diet where you're eating your food. You're not blending it. You're not juicing it or anything like that. And that you're eating any, any kind of nutritionally dense components like greens, berries, those types of things, you are eating them. You're not blending them. There are many reasons why Dr. McDougal prefers that and stands by that. But one of them is that it is not, it would never have happened that you would have been, you know, in, in the course of natural human history, have had access to something that was processed, you know, by these sharp, sharp blades, you know, a thousand strokes a minute or something, you know what I mean? And so um, people do have issues like you can get kidney stones from taking in too many oxalates. Some people are prone to that. Um, and so that's not to say, I, I in no way am trying to say her program is bad, don't do her program. But what I am trying to say is if you're going to do her program, 
do her program, you know, but to be like, I'm doing her program and the McDougal program, there are going to be places where they don't line up where they're almost like counterproductive. So one example would be if you're, if you're eating, you know, several servings of nuts and seeds a day for health reasons, because somebody in a different program is promoting like a higher intake of nuts and seeds that is counterproductive to trying to lose weight. Yeah. So if you're trying to lose weight, you know, eating a bunch of nuts and seeds is not going to be the best for that. Um, so anyway, all that to say, I can't really tell you guys um, much about smoothies, except that it's not something that we recommend. And like I said, you can have a smoothie and be on McDougal, but it's, but the smoothie itself is probably not a starch centered by and large, I would imagine a starch centered meal and it's partially digested. So that's the other thing is we want you to be eating, eating food, chewing it <laughs> and digesting it all by yourself, not partially digested by a blender. And then you do the rest of the work. Um, your blood sugar, you know, is affected by that processing. Um, you know, when you eat whole foods in their natural form without um, blending them or juicing them or things like that, there's a process that your body goes through to break those down to pull out the blood glucose. And it's, you know, wrapped up in fiber and there's vitamins and minerals and all kinds of stuff that slow things down. So, um, so anyway, that's that. But you know, it's fine. If you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. I would just caution you and say nuts, seeds, and avocados are still, or I would say nuts and seeds are still very, very, very calorie dense. They still will slow down your weight loss. And uh, it's not necessary to eat mega doses of greens to experience healing with autoimmune illnesses. I'll put it that way. And that makes perfect sense too. So just so you know, like I a hundred percent agree with you. And I've said this a bunch of times that I, especially in the beginning, when you have one goal, if it's a, a numbers goal on the scale or a, a health number or something like that, one of the things that we found it's much easier to just have one program because even the doctors that are close together, you know, like, Dr. Bernard or Dr. Greger and Dr. McDougall, there's a lot of those in particular that overlap and work well together. However, to me, there's enough little contradictions that can really confuse you. So as I, I noticed just in the talks that we have and the questions that people ask me and when we have you on, is there's, a, there's enough confusion about just the starch solution, which is pretty daggone simple, in my opinion. Because like, if you can't figure out all the little teeny tiny bits of things that your brain's trying to throw at you, eat a potato, right? Eat a potato, have some vegetables, ta-da! So that's one of the reasons why I love it. And, and, and I know it, it can be more complicated, it can be, delicious but on the days that you just can't think you can't brain or adult you can get some rice or a potato out of the fridge and some veggies and you have done an a plus job yeah that's we've we've had that happen a couple times and and just so everybody knows so that's why i think if anyone's having trouble, like if you're like, well, I've been trying to lose weight for a long time. I've been trying to do this for a long time. I've been trying, this is a real easy way because you can just go to the lowest common denominator, stay healthy, eat food. And then when you have great days, you can make oat, ancho, blender, queso to pour over your potato and vegetables or make some chili in the slow cooker. So that's why I love it. Before I did the McDougal program, I will say the, re the only reason I know about the, the Brooke Goldner protocols is because I was doing the smoothies um, myself. So I can only, I can speak to this much. <laughs> and it was a, a very easy way to get a lot of greens in. 
and at that point I was still trying to figure out with my fatty liver, you know, like, is this a result of my autoimmune disease, Graves disease? And I was doing some searching, but I didn't follow. She has a hyper nourishing protocol, which is raw foods and Lord bless all y'all that do raw foods. It just, it's, it's not in my nature to just, in the summer I can eat raw food. So it's like to, the idea of eating raw all the time, it would have to really cure me real fast for me. It's not that I wouldn't do it and it's not that I think it's bad either. I have no opinion, but for me personally to do that and to be a recipe developer, that would be really difficult. Um, but I feel like Dr. McDougall is so easy. It's just, anyhow, so that's what I have to say too. So it's, it, and a lot of people do mix and match things. And I hear about that and I've mixed and matched things. I think when you start and having one thing that you start on, and then I'm sure later on, and we see this, we've, ta we've talked here about this too, you know, then you see the bloggers or the other people kind of go on and add on and then it's no longer the starch solution if it's an individual thing. And I, that's hard for the starch solution, but you know, I think it works out. For some people, it seems some people can eat different ways. I don't know, that's just, I have a couple of thoughts. Can I share? Okay. Just, Absolutely. Okay, Please on this. do. Okay. So first of all, um, you know, I noticed I was able to catch a couple of comments here and people are saying things like, I did this and I lost 20 pounds or my friend did this and she's having great results. That's fabulous. I am not telling you not to do it. I am going to tell you though, I am going to speak. I'm going to be a person who can speak to the McDougal way of eating. I, there are any other number. I mean, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of different ways of eating that you could add to it, you know, if you wanted to. And I'm not going to be able to give you information about what happens when you combine this, this way and this way, but I can tell you this, and this is, this is the way that I've grown to see it because I used to kind of mix and match and sort of, um, you know, take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And it was all consuming. It was back when I was learning about all these different ways of eating, it was all consuming and took up a lot of time and space in my mind. And I'll, I'll tell you the approach that I have now, it's very much like the approach we have in medicine. So anybody who is in the medical field knows that we are always trying to do the least invasive thing first. Okay. So if you came to us today, Kathy, and you're like, my throat hurts. We are not to go in there and be like, well, let's take your tonsils out. I mean, that's just like, that's it. That's the solution. <laughs> let's take your tonsils out today. <laughs> we need to do the least invasive thing. Okay. Well, can we try gargling? Can we try, you know, rest? Can we try, you know, if necessary, you have something going on, a, a medication or something like that, but we're trying to do the least invasive thing first. The simple solution is most often the correct one. And so I see diet in much the same way. And, and by the way, I recognize this is my opinion, but it's based on not some observation of just a couple of my neighbors or something like that. It is hundreds of people that we've worked with in the McDougal program. So it's a large observational study from which I have built this opinion, which is that do the simplest thing first and just see what kind of results you get. And then if you need additional interventions or additional changes or tweaks to your diet, try that. So for anyone who's doing a smoothie protocol where you're spending, I would guess somewhere over $5, you know, um, a pop in greens alone, you know what I mean? Um, it's that's expensive. It's labor intensive. You know, it's all of those things. Uh, maybe before you do that, just possibly try just the re regular McDougal diet. You know, if you have an autoimmune thing going on, just trying that now. I, I know I'm sure there are many of you guys out there who have done that. I'm not saying that you didn't. I'm just saying that would be my recommendation. Tr start as simple 
And, and that's what Kathy, I think, is communicating that she loves about the McDougal diet is that it is so simple. It really is. You go get a potato, A+. Plus. We don't require you to have a potato and half an ounce of seeds and, you know, four cups of greens and a berry and make sure you sprinkle the berry with vinegar or else the, you know, the nutrients from the berry won't make it. A, no. Think about the, the natural course of human history. No one was doing that. that. That we weren't doing like food pairing and, you know, if you use this much cumin powder, then this thing will be activated and all of that. It's like, if you want to do that and that's fun for you, great. But most of the time, what it does is just end up driving people crazy. And I don't want you to go crazy. I want you to have a good life that, that you live that is, is more than just thinking about what you're eating. So anyway, all that to say, I would start, you know, think of it like a funnel, like start way up here, the McDougal diet. You're eating a starch centered diet, fruits and vegetables, but starches are the center. Fabulous. You're still having your autoimmune stuff. Usually then where you go is not straight to, you know, mega doses of vitamins and nutrients smoothies. The next thing would be a partial elimination diet, going to the things that we know are inflammatory foods for larger populations of people. Many of you guys know that for people who have autoimmune, many of them have a sensitivity to gluten. Some people have soy, some people it's corn, some people it is berries, you know, some people it's tomatoes. I, you know, but when you're doing, when you're doing the starch solution and you're doing a smoothie protocol and you're doing, you know, whatever and other thing, how will you ever be able to know which thing it was that was the thing that healed you? I Whereas totally was, get that. I was yeah. there. Yes. So just start as simply as possible. And then we can start to drill down. If, if that's not working after a few weeks, give it a few weeks. If that's not working, then we start to drill down. Okay. What, am, what is still in my diet that may still be inflammatory to me? And then we start looking at those things. And then we go, you know, down from there. Does that make sense? It makes such total sense, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think what happens, and, and I can only speak of it for myself, you know, you get these diagnoses and you're like, crap, what am I going to do? And that's when, if you're impatient like I am, that you go, okay, well, let's try all the things and let's see what we can do. And I admit that that was a mistake. And, and I only saw results when I picked one, which was the McDougal diet. So I can't say that maybe somebody else could pick something else and it would work fine. But the McDougal diet is, it, it is easy and simple. And, and at the same time, you really can add beautiful flavors and color and, you know, so if you don't want, if you're like, I can't eat a potato and green beans for the rest of my life. You don't have to. <laughs> that but, sounds good to me. But you could if you're Cheryl, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> but yeah, I think that's one of the things that I see a lot is that people just start picking and choosing and then they're like, because like Dr. Greger's dozen, you know, versus this versus that. And you, I think you just can't combine them all the same way because those are little specific things but potatoes are always easy. So yeah. Tracy wants, Tracy Reese wants to know, do you still work in a hospital setting or just the McDougal program? Um, I do work for um, a hospital system and I work, I do like a couple different things. Um, I do community education and community preventative care, but we also get contracts sometimes where we go and provide relief work in the hospital. So technically, yes, I still work in the hospital setting, but only from time to time as my, the unit that I work for gets contracted to that kind of thing. No, oh, that's awesome. We don't, we want to keep you in the McDougal program all the time. Oh, I am. Yes. I know, I know, I know you do a lot of work and for sure. Yeah. And I know Dr. McDougall has a lot to say about this. Real is saying, I'm so confused about supplements and vitamins. Please discuss. And I think that that happens a lot because even, isn't it 
the meatless athlete also now has some supplements and things like that. So the more supplement lines that happen and get advertised to us, I think the more confused we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So generally speaking, we at the McDougal program, we do not recommend vitamins and supplements with the exception of a B12. We recommend that everybody over the age of 50 takes a B12 vitamin, whether you are vegan, vegetarian, or regular standard American diet eater. Um, so B12. Now, on occasion, I have heard Dr. McDougall say that there are certain populations that might benefit from some vitamin D supplementation, but these are very individual recommendations. So the large sweeping recommendation is no vitamins or supplements outside of B12. This is if you're eating this way, you will get everything that you need from the food. And then if you have a unique medical situation that warrants something else, then that's something that you would want to talk to your doctor about. Uh, the beauty of going through the McDougal program is that your doctor would be Dr. Lim or Dr. McDougal, and they could make, make recommendations about supplements and things like that. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not like I can just say like, nope, no vitamins or supplements ever for anyone. But by and large, most people do not need nor do they benefit from, and at the worst, they may be harmed by the addition of supplements and vitamins. Yeah, thank you so much for being so concise about that, because I know Cheryl and I do take vitamin D, but ours were like, like the, the, a doctor we had said, Cheryl, I think you're a hobbit, because she was taking mega doses and it did nothing. Like, she was so, I, I, what I like about the McDougal program is the flexibility, because he's a real doctor and knows, knows stuff, right? So, and, and things are so individual. Now, Tracy Reese has another um, vitamin question. I don't know if, they, I just bought an EU natural multivitamin that has 27 milligrams mg of iron. Is that too high? We would not recommend an iron yeah. vitamin or a multivitamin. Okay, that's what I figured. Um, another question, does Stacy like people doing fixed meals or grazing all day? Whatever you feel like doing, truly. So I eat meals, three meals a day, sometimes four, and then I graze as needed if I'm still hungry outside of that. The most important thing is listening to your hunger and fullness cues. So eating when you're hungry, physiologically hungry, and stopping when you feel comfortably full. Comfortably full is the question mark that everybody is always like, what does that mean? Well, the way I say it is comfortably full is you finish your meal and you can get up and go get the mail or you can get up and go on with your day. Your food is not meant to take you out. It's meant to energize you for the next portion of your day. So if you're eating a meal and then you're just laid out afterwards because you just can't move or you're so full or you're so tired or anything like that, then that's not doing the right thing for you, for your body. So you're probably, you're probably over full at that point. Now, let me say one other thing about that. There is a slump around lunchtime or right after lunchtime that most people hit. And it's not necessarily that you ate too much. It's that that is your natural siesta time for a nap. Okay. So, and that is, that's a normal part of your circadian rhythm for many of us. And so if you feel a little bit tired in the afternoon, most of the time you'll just, oh, you'll just get over it. It's just a little hump that you get over in the afternoon. Um, sometimes you may need to lie down and take a little rest, you know, a short little nap or just rest your eyes, that kind of thing. Those types of things can be really, um, revitalizing, but it's okay to feel a little tired after lunch. What I'm talking about is when you go to brunch with your girlfriends and you eat so much that you come home and you're just like, well, the day is shot and it's only 10 o'clock. What am I going to do? That's over full. That's not comfortably full. Is there a, a way if someone's learning to figure out what full means? I know that in the blue zones, and I think Dr. Lim used the same thing for me. He said, eat to an eight out of 10. Yeah, they say 80% fullness, right? 
I don't like that. And I'll tell you why. It's not that I disagree with it. I don't. But I don't like it because it is so completely impossible to quantify what 80% full is. <laughs> I agree with you on that one. Yeah, you can't do that. You're a human. You're not a robot or a machine of some kind. So I would just say you want, like I said, you want to be able to get up and move around and go on to your next task for the day. For example, like just now I had lunch. I scarfed it down. Kathy and Cheryl were on. I was like, I got to just scarf down some lunch real quick. And um, I, but I feel great. Like, I feel like I could go out and sweep off the driveway. I could chase my kids around if I needed to. I'm satisfied. I'm not hungry anymore, but I definitely am not limited in any way, shape or form by having just had a meal. That's what you're looking for. And as far as how can someone learn time and patience, and you're not going to get it right. I still get it wrong sometimes, even though I've been trying to do this for years, you know, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. It's okay. It's not the end of the world, but you're going to keep practicing. You practice it every day. And so I get pretty spot on with comfortably full most of the time because I practice it day after day after day. And you will too. I love that. Cause I just wanted to leave that with people as a way, like, cause for us, it's been a process of just rediscovering when we're hungry, when we're full, things like that. So that's something we've been doing in the McDougal program. So here's another question. This is going to be, <laughs> Paula says, will eating carbs like potatoes make my insulin resistance worse? Can I eat more fiber and greens and still have potatoes? Wait, I, I don't understand that part. Will, okay. Can I eat more fibers and greens and still have potatoes? What does that mean? Yeah, okay, so here, and I'll put both of us here, and I'll try and look too to see if Paula's qualified this. So I think it looks like first, she's like worried that eating carbs like potatoes is gonna make her insulin resistance worse, which is, you hear that a lot from not the whole food plant-based community and then she's so that was one question but then i'm kind of translating perhaps incorrectly can i eat more fiber and greens and still have potatoes i've also seen some places where they talk about if you eat great greens and other fibrous foods i forget what the lady's name is it came up for me so she says you eat those and then you eat your um like potatoes and it doesn't spike your insulin the same way. So I'm wondering if that's what she means. I may be being too specific, but that's another thing that's going around right now. So I think it's about those two things. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Paula, you said her name is? Yes. And I'm going to look and see if there's any other qualifications. Okay. I just want to apologize in advance, Paula, if I'm mis misunderstanding your question and totally answer it incorrectly. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Okay. Um, no, eating potatoes and starches will not make insulin resistance worse. The thing that makes insulin resistance worse is fat, eating a high fat diet, um, especially animal fats animal products and um, things that are high in cholesterol, which is only animal products. So what you want to do for insulin resistance is eat a low fat, which will come naturally if you eat a starch centered diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. You want to limit your intake of oils and um, nuts and seeds because they're high, high in fat, high in plant fat. And even though nuts and seeds are healthy, they it's difficult to get out out from under the thumb of diabetes if you're still eating high fat foods and so you need to limit those while you're losing your weight and reversing your insulin resistance but potatoes and rice corn quinoa oatmeal all of that stuff those are your friend for insulin resistance as long as you are following a starch centered diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables you're you should be able to reverse your insulin resistance now what will not work, and this is something that that almost seems like obvious, but but we just don't we <laughs> we just don't fully grasp this. Which is, if you're gonna do the diet, in so far as you're like, I'm gonna start eating potatoes like crazy, that's fabulous. But you also have to do the other tenets of the diet, which is 
you're going to stop eating animal products and minimize your intake of oils. And so um, by doing those things, you allow your cells the opportunity to empty out all that globbed up fat that's in your cells, which will make you more insulin sensitive because then when your pancreas releases insulin, it can go down, grab that blood glucose, that blood sugar out of your, I'm sorry. Yes, blood sugar out of your bloodstream and take it into your clear cells that, that have, have let go of the fat. So it's really about eating a low fat diet that's going to help your insulin resistance. And by low fat, I, I, know, I know what you mean, but you mean no added fats as far as like oil like real oil like when we think versus like there's some fat in oatmeal because oats let me tell you yes i'm so glad you said that there's fat in every plant food every plant food um so by saying that um that you're not eating animal products you're automatically removing all of the the fat that has you know, cholesterol in it because animal products are what carry cholesterol. But the reason why it's important to still specify low fat is because a lot of people who go vegan are eating vegan um, processed foods that are like pumped full of oil. So, so those are high, high fat items. And there are even some plant foods that will, even if they may be healthy, like nuts and seeds, avocado, um, those things still are higher in fat than we want you to, to be if you're trying to reverse diabetes or trying to lose weight. They make it more difficult, specifically nuts and seeds and nut butters will make it difficult for you to lose weight because they're very, very calorie dense. So low fat just happens naturally when you eat a starch centered diet with fruits and vegetables, you will naturally be low in fat. We do not need you. Listen, people, please listen. You do not need to be comparing the grams of fat of oatmeal versus grits or rice or potatoes. No, you never need to look at a gram of fat on a nutrition label ever again. If you're eating whole plant foods and you're eating a starch centered diet, I want to get I want to make an example of someone who's probably here right now. And I love this person very much and so do you guys and i'm not going to use this person's name but i met with a patient earlier today who said something about well i just learned that white rice is lower fat than brown rice so i'm gonna stick with white rice i nearly fell out of my chair because it does not matter at all how much fat is in white rice or is in brown rice brown rice and white rice are both go foods they're great I would prefer you eat brown rice. And the reason is because when you have white rice, it's it's high, a more highly processed product. And so some of the vitamins and nutrients are, are stripped out when you take out the outer hull of the rice. So brown is preferable, white is okay. But the last thing I want you doing is looking up how many grams of fat in brown rice or white, white, white rice or red rice or wild rice. I mean, it's, it's, it is absolutely irrelevant. You're eating a whole natural plant food that is, um, low in calorie density. So don't worry about how many grams of fat are in it. I love that. And cause, cause it's like, it's easy. So we don't need life is hard. We don't yes. need to make this hard. There's going to be hard. If you're like, my life is too easy. Let me make this hard. Make so, something else hard. Come help me clean up my house. You, you've got the time and the energy. Come on over. Um, but, but I think it's the same thing. Like when you were saying that, I was just thinking, it's like if someone was like, well, I want to volunteer, but I want to volunteer where I get the most brownie points. So is saving dogs better than saving cats? Is, you know handing yes. out gloves to homeless people better than handing out food. Oh my so I gosh. think we're getting into this little minutia that, no, you're being a good person. You're being helpful. That's wonderful. And it's just, instead of making these choices about helping other people, the it's helping yourself, right? 
I wanna add one thing to that. That is such a beautiful analogy. And because I think we can all relate to this, it's as if you're sitting on the couch trying to decide whether you're gonna give out gloves or give out hats to homeless people. And because you don't know which one is better, you go, forget it, I can't do it. And you don't give out anything. That is exactly the same thing as this. And this is what I see people do all the time. They're sitting there going, oh, but I like white rice better than brown rice. And oh, but then Stacy said brown rice is better. And so ugh, forget it. I'm just going to eat the potato chips. And it's like, no, just <laughs> just eat whole plant foods and as close to their natural form as possible. I, I love that. And I think that's great, too, because I wasn't even thinking about that because there are other things in my life that I've gone oh, I can't research this anymore, so I'm just not even going to try to make a decision now. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's why I keep coming back to, and also, I just happen to love potatoes. So like Thanksgiving, I, because of the places we went and because I did classes, I eat mashed potatoes every day, and I'm like, living my best life. Mashed potatoes, a little compliant, no oil added gravy, I'm good. But, yeah. um, and while you were very clear about smoothies, We've got a couple of little things I want to add in. And then I actually discovered something last week as well that fits in. So we kind of talked about um, where do smoothies fit in the program. And I'm believing they're talking about the McDougal program. And I think that would be more of a desserty, treaty kind of thing. But it doesn't really fit into the program. But it's not like you may never have. I think that's something you were doing. And I'm going to get this question in, too, so you don't have to do this twice. <laughs> and Sandy was saying, can we add beans to smoothies? Fixes the mixing starch, but not the partially digested situation. So she does, it's clear. And I have seen last week a smoothie cookbook of someone who, was, who used to do McDougal. It's, this is not trying to claim that this is McDougal, but does use beans and potatoes as the basis of smoothies to add in some starch. What do you think of that? And is it just, you know, how would it be different if I'm like saying, this is my new breakfast versus I'm going to make a sweet potato pie milkshake smoothie for my Thanksgiving dessert? It depends entirely on what you're trying to do. So if, so I'll tell you this, this, this might be illuminating for some people. So when we have people, because we do, we have people who come through the program who are underweight and are trying to gain weight. What do you think the first thing Dr. Lem tells them to do is? Smoothies. Why? Because it's much, much easier to pack calories into a smoothie and for those calories to make their way into your bloodstream and to be used all up as energy when they've been partially digested in the form of a smoothie. Now, first of all, I want to apologize to everyone out there for using the term partially digested. I do acknowledge that that is disgusting. <laughs> However, it it's so clear yeah. though. It's so it clear. It is. Well, it's doing, it's doing part of the job of digestion for your body. So anyway, all that to say, Dr. Lim, I've had him do it. You know, we have people who come through the program who are in cancer treatment and they've lost too much weight, things like that. We tell them to eat nut butters and dump them into a smoothie. And yes, go ahead and get your greens while you're at it and all of that. But the priority when we recommend smoothies is weight gain. We are trying to put calories into that person as efficiently as possible. So when you ask where do smoothies fit in the program, we do recommend them to people who are underweight as a strategy to try to gain weight. Most of the people, as you can imagine, just like in the general population of the Western world, most of the people who come through the program are trying to lose weight. They are not underweight, they are overweight. And so we caution them against using smoothies because even though um, you can, so I'll give you an example. Someone earlier gave their recipe for a smoothie, which sounded very, like a very nutritious smoothie, but I want to tell you, so I wish I could scroll, maybe I can find it, but they were saying, and in person who said this, I just want you to know, I'm just using this as an example. Oh yes, I see. Okay, Janice, thank you for sharing your recipe 
Um, I'm just using you as an example. So I'm not going to get this exactly right. And I'm not saying this is what you're doing, but you had mentioned a pound of power greens, which um, is a whole clamshell of power greens, which I imagine is probably somewhere in the 150 calorie range or something like that. Um, frozen fruit, depending on how much, let's say you do a banana and a cup of cherries, that's probably like 200 calories. So there you're at 350 and three tablespoons of cacao. Ooh, I have no idea, but I would guess that's somewhere around a hundred calories. So then you're talking about a 450 calorie drink and that amount of food, if you were to put it on a play first plate, First of all, you would need a platter, not a plate. It would have to be huge. If you were to take all those greens out, I mean, just imagine and you put them on there um, and then you take a banana and then you take a thing of cherries and then you put the cook. That's an enormous amount of food that you would not necessarily sit down and eat with a fork, fork to mouth, okay? So when you take that and you put it into a blender and it blends it down, maybe you've added water and you blend it down to this much, you're concentrating your calories. And even though it may be totally nutritious and great and everything, it's liquid calories, which don't register the same to your body for satiety. So like, you're not gonna be as satisfied after you drink something as you would be if you sat down and ate it. Because when you eat something and you keep that bulk, it presses on the, um, the receptors in inside your stomach to show that you have eaten enough volume of food because what your body's looking for is it's looking for volume it's looking for weight it's looking for um for calories and so you know taking this big volume of food shrinking it down and drinking it is not going to provide satiety in the same way that it does if you sit down and ate all of that food um Oh, and the beans thing, the beans and starches. If you want to make a beanie potato smoothie, like knock yourself out, but I don't think it's a good idea from a weight loss perspective. If you have to, if you are needing to lose weight, smoothies are probably not a great strategy for you. And I would much rather you sit down and eat a baked potato with some beans and some salsa on it. Doesn't that sound a lot better than blending it into a smoothie? I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but no. I don't really want a potato and bean smoothie. I would rather have like a plate of food. I agree. I agree with you. Like I could see having a small, like sweet potato pie shake kind of thing, or like that's the same thing. Like if I have a scoop of Ninja creamy, but to me, that's a little something after, whereas I don't want it to be bulked up with beans or a lot of potatoes and that be a whole meal yeah. for me because it's, I, I see the enjoyment in sitting down and really just chewing. And, and it, what's ironic, I hadn't gone down here. Giselle had actually asked, what do you recommend for someone who's underweight? So you, that just double answered that one. Uh, yeah. Lizard greetings, which is just a really delightful name. Um, are legumes considered a starch? How important are they according to the starch solution? They are a starch. Um, beans are great, super healthy. They're very good for you. Um, you know, the blue zones people are always talking about the power of beans and legumes for longevity. You know, the populations that are the longest lived do seem to consume a good fair amount of beans and legumes. However, um, from a program perspective, we don't recommend that you have to have any certain number of beans and legumes. We have people who are sensitive to legumes and cannot eat them at all. And they're perfectly fine and healthy and thriving and doing great. So, um, they, but they do count as a starch, yes. Oh, that's great. Um... Oh, and Sarah's saying, my beautiful mother passed away in 2019 due to a B12 deficiency. So she's reminding us all to take B12. I had never heard of that before. Me neither. No, I haven't either. I'm so sorry to hear that, Sarah. Yeah, that's really scary. Uh, Tia says, are sweet potatoes in the same category as regular potatoes? 
potatoes go bad so fast no matter how I store I finally you guys got some potatoes <laughs> that aren't rotting the first week I got them I think something weird happened with potato growing this year but just to reiterate the question because I think this is in our sweet potatoes in the same category as potatoes I I'm assuming they mean same category meaning they're healthy and you can eat them as your preferred starch yes yeah, I think I think what's happening is sometimes people, and again, this is me kind of making a leap, but I think, are they in the same category? They would be considered one of the starches that you could interchangeably do, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, corn, right? Yeah, so definitely. all of those are starches, they're mm -hmm. rice, grains, equally okay on the starch solution. There's not like one... I think we all, I feel like the potato is the winter starch, but that's a personal choice, I feel like, right? But yeah. all of them are kind of equal. Yes, definitely. I love sweet potatoes. I eat them every day. She I eat the Japanese too. sweet potatoes every day. There is not a sweet potato I don't like. I like them all. I've got some giant ubes to the purple Ooh. sweet potatoes that I can't wait yeah. to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, T.S. also says, I'm loving this talk. I've been trying all the things like Kathy mentioned to help with some health issues. Like we were talking about, it gets confusing. Very tiring to figure out exactly what to eat when. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's some confused people out there, Stacy. if you gave them like a, a 10 second thing they could do today, what would that look like? 10 Meal seconds, one. okay. Eat it could be more than 10 whole, seconds. Okay. <laughs> you know what? What it's going to require of you, especially if you've been researching for a long time and trying to figure the whole mystery out, is to step aside from everything that you've been reading and watching and consuming and run an experiment. Because until you do and put into practice the things that you're learning, you won't know if they're going to work for your body. My recommendation would be, like I said earlier, start as simply as possible. And I really do think the McDougal diet is that hits that nail on the head. So eating whole natural plant foods in as close to their natural state as possible, starch centered. What that means is all of us grew up, most of us grew up with a plate that was meat centered, right? That was your entree. That's not what we're doing anymore. We're doing starch centers. So your potatoes, rice, corn, quinoa, barley, beans, legumes, pasta, bread, those types of things. Those are the center of your meal. They should take up at least 50% of your plate with the addition of fruits and vegetables for taste and variety and eat that. That's what I would tell you to do. Eat that, run that experiment and see what kind of results you get. I love that. And um, do you still have some time for some more questions if we can? Oh, yeah. Going? Okay, sure. okay, cool. Because we've done our hour. And I would just say, too, like my cheater way would say eat oatmeal or grits for breakfast. This is a template, not a what you have to. But like if you just sort of like it's all too much oatmeal or, or grits, then you could have, I don't know, like some rice and veggies for lunch and a potato and veggies for dinner or vice versa. And mm -hmm. if you need to, cause I know sometimes if you just are, maybe you just do a Mary's mini and you just have potatoes, just do something that makes it easy that you don't have to obsess about things. Okay. Absolutely. So a starch with the addition of a fruit and or vegetable for each meal. Now, some people then go, oh, I can only have one starch, so I can have rice or beans. No, 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 no. You can have as many, you can have 12 different starches if you want. So That's it's, how it's however simple you wanna make it, but the more simple you make it, the easier it will be to sustain, most likely. Yeah, and, and just, I know with the holidays and we're in Black Friday, which makes my brain ping all over everything. That's why I was like thinking it could be helpful. Betsy has a question, is there a limit to how much soy products can be eaten? I've gotten confused from last week. Dr. Marbus talked with Chef AJ about osteoporosis and she recommends soy every day. So again, 
this is most of the questions end up coming back to conflicted doctors or conflicting yeah. info. Mm -hmm. We do not limit soy on the McDougal diet. We do not. The only thing that we recommend is you stay completely away from um, soy protein isolate, which is what you is used in a lot of these fake meats and fake cheeses and things like that. Those are like Franken soy. Okay. They're not, they're not the natural soy product. Um, soy minimally processed is how you want to consume it, which is how it is in soy milk or in, um, tofu or tempeh or edamame beans, obviously, are, are as minimally processed as you can get. Um, I don't know if this is more of a question for you, but you may have some. What is a good low fat cheese or cream to use? And I would say oat, make oat cream. So like make oat milk, but use extra oats. And if you make homemade oat milk, it will turn, it will thicken your gravy. You don't need to add any flowers or anything. Do you have any things that you like, Stacy? You are definitely the expert on this. Um, the only thing I can tell you is there is one, and this, I mean, it depends on what your goals are again, but there's a cream cheese that I get for my kids because they just love it and there's no oil and it's oh. relatively, seems to be relatively good, which is um, the Kite Hill um, cream cheese. It's almond based. It is not a low fat product. And so if you use it, you want to use it sparingly. And really it's great for kiddos. Uh, might not be as good for grown women like many of us are who are trying not to grow more. Um, but it's really good. My kids love it and there's no oil added to it. That's great. And if you guys, I've got uh, several compliant queso sauces including an oat, a couple of oat quesos that are just super cheap and easy. So if you want to go to healthyslowcooking.com and look up any of that, um, go right ahead. Um, let's see. <laughs> Tracy Hat says, what if you hate greens and you only eat them in smoothies? Well, we have no required greens that you need to eat. So if you've been told you have to eat 10 servings of greens or something like that, it's not by Dr. McDougal. <laughs> so, right. um, but if you're trying to get a certain amount of greens in each day because you have a personal goal or you are following another doctor or something like that, and you can only get them in smoothies, then sounds like you know what you have to do. Um, but no, we wouldn't require you to have any certain amount of greens each day. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that I've heard Dr. McDougal say several times is that if all you ate was potatoes and green beans, you're okay. Just yeah. in, in the, not that green beans have any special powers, so let me, green beans and carrots, green beans and squash, green, you know, or what, any of those things, but that you don't, he's not saying you have to have greens, you have to have these other things for sure. Um, Dilia says, what are some foods that cause inflammation that we should avoid? Well, um, animal products, animal protein causes inflammation. Dairy is highly inflammatory for most people. In fact, it probably is for you and you don't know it. <laughs> so most of us have a dairy intolerance um, of some degree, whether we recognize it or not. So um, those are the main ones, but then there are still some plant foods that tend to be more inflammatory for some people than others. Now, most, before I even say anything about that, most of us are fine with all the plant foods and there's nothing you need to worry about. Most people are not sensitive to gluten, for example, like they're not getting all inflamed from gluten. But if you have an inflammatory condition or an autoimmune illness, or you're having, you're having symptoms that aren't good and you're still eating a plant-based diet, you're eating a plant-based diet with no animal products and no oil, which are known to be inflammatory. Um, those being the most inflammatory things then you then you might look at some of the foods in the plant kingdom and go is this am i sensitive to this the main ones tend to be for for people um, with autoimmune illnesses and things like that gluten 
could be some people soy very very small percentage of the population soy some people corn corn they have a sensitivity sensitivity to corn nuts definitely nuts for lots of people um but this is one of those cases where I never want people to hear me saying this list of foods and go, well, I just won't eat any of those. No, please do not stop eating any of those foods unless you have done like an elimination diet. If you're really suffering, you're having inflammation, okay? You're having a major problem and it's not getting better on your normal McDougal diet. That's when we start looking at, okay, what's still in the diet that could potentially be inflammatory. That's a perfectly healthy food for most people but for whatever reason is causing me inflammation. That's the only time you wanna do that. In fact, you know, one one thing to note is that for people who don't have a sensitivity to gluten, it is not a good idea to eliminate gluten. And the reason is because by eliminating and avoiding gluten, you can actually create a gluten sensitivity by not ever being exposed to it. So we do not recommend that everybody eliminate every potentially inflammatory food that might be inflammatory for one person and might not be for another. It's very individual. I love that. And yeah, and again, I think it's so easy to like throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Because we hear so much in the media about inflammation and we've Mm -hmm. had that conversation before. So this is kind of a two part question from Surser. Um, one was how long should the experiment last, which I think goes all the way back to when we said just experiment with this. It says, what about protein for highly active athletes? So this is a different question than, you know, Uncle Bob saying, where do you get your protein from? And I know B means legumes, et cetera. I'm not sure what B means. Was legumes? Beans, I think. Oh, beans, legumes, et cetera, have protein. But my muscles have been getting smaller, not maintaining, are getting bigger and stronger while they are actually trying for that. Right. Okay. So this is based on misinformation. And um, I will just tell you it's misinformation that we've all been subject to, which is that the idea that in order to build muscle, you need to eat muscle. That would be just like saying, you know, if I want to get smarter, I need to eat some kind of brain or something like that. It doesn't actually work that way. Or in order to get better skin, I need to eat skin. Like that's just not the case. Okay. So think about it this way. What are the strongest, some of the strongest creatures on the planet? Elephants, gorillas, how much muscle they have, they're totally vegetarians and vegan. Well, they're vegan, right? Okay, so so you get plenty of protein in plant foods. I can speak as someone, I'm I'm an endurance runner, so I run every day and I run longer distances than the average person and I've never once had to worry about my protein intake and my muscles aren't wasting away. And so if you're having, if you're noticing some muscle wasting, it's more likely the result of inactivity and age. Cause as we age our mu- and we get smaller, our muscles have less work to do. And so they do, they get smaller. So you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to be intentional about weight training, resistance training, exercising, getting out there and moving your body. That's one thing. But if you're, if you're concerned about protein, just know that every plant food has protein in it. Definitely your higher levels of protein in the plant kingdom are going to be beans and legumes. Also whole grains. A lot of people forget about that. Whole grains have a lot of protein in them. But um, you, don't, you don't need to worry about your muscles wasting away eating this way. You know, that's just not, that's not what happens. Um, You're not losing muscle because you're eating a plant-based diet. Okay, great. We got two more quick, at least one quick question. How do you feel about eating lentil or chickpea pasta from Diana? Great. Good. I figured that was an easy one. (laughs) Giselle, who is looking to gain weight, is also asking, what do you recommend for those who have thyroid issues, hypo or hyper? Is there any certain thing we recommend in the McDougal program? Same diet, same exact diet. Um, 
that's about it. And if you have a thyroid, you know, if you have a thyroid that's pooping out on you, taking thyroid medication is life changing. And I will tell you, as you know, someone who gets to see how Dr. McDougall and Dr. Lim work, they don't take their their goal is not to take you off your thyroid medication, because the reality is most people will have to continue to take their thyroid medication. However, we do see it. I would say at least one or two people every program are able to get off their thyroid medication, whether that's the diet or whether it was like over diagnosis or incorrect diagnosis of the thyroid issue to begin with. Who knows? It's probably a combination of the two, but it's the same diet for hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, cancer, lupus, you know, heart disease, diabetes. It's all the same starch centered diet with fruits and vegetables. Okay. And just one follow up and then I think we will be done. And it's back to Sir Sir who is saying, no, that's not what I think. I eat beans and grains at every meal. And I just kind of want to say, I think Stacy was just trying to set the stage for everybody else who might not be you to give the answer. Uh, I eat uh, a lot and for five years, I've shrunk down to less than a hundred pounds. I'm actively engaged seven days a week in activity. So depending on your height, it's possible that you are underweight now. And if you're underweight, you will see that you start to lose muscle. And the reason is because your body, your frame has less to carry around. And so you're not giving your body as much of a resistance workout or a weight training workout, just doing your normal life as you did when you were, you know, 25, 50 pounds heavier than you are now. You're going to have to be more intentional about resistance training and weight training. That's what it is. And if you're underweight, then then you need to be doing some of the things we talked about earlier, like adding in smoothies, adding in nut butters, you know, and nuts and seeds, more dry starches as opposed to wet starches. You know, I get this all the time where I have these little, like little, little ladies, you know, maybe a little bit on the frail side. And they're like, I had my oatmeal for breakfast. And I'm like, did you put some walnuts on it? And they're like, God, no, you know? And it's like, yes, you need to put something on it. You need to be supplementing your calories. Oatmeal is not going to be enough for a tiny, tiny, tiny woman to gain weight. You're just never going to gain weight eating oatmeal. You're just not going to, nor are you going to gain weight eating potatoes, which is the good news that everybody loves to hear when they come to us. Well, and um, saying I'm in the gym doing weight work classes, running or cycling. Um, so if if you're running and cycling, you are high, you are burning a lot of calories. OK, which means you're going to have to take in a lot more calories. So someone like you who is already underweight and you're trying to gain weight, but you're also doing these highly intense cardio workouts in fat burning workouts, you're gonna to have to try even harder to gain weight. So so it's, it's all about being strategic about what you're eating. When you get up in the morning, are you eating a bowl of oatmeal with berries, which is a fantastic, perfect weight loss meal? Or are you eating oatmeal with peanut butter and maybe some date syrup and maybe some, you know, walnuts or toast with avocado? Those are gonna be the things that are going to help put weight back on. And you, you have to be intentional about it. It doesn't happen accidentally. It's the same as weight loss. You can't, nobody accidentally loses 50 pounds, you know? Unfortunately, it's very difficult to accidentally, if you're underweight. For those of us who are overweight or have struggled with our weight our whole lives, we can accidentally put on 50 pounds, no problem, eight, eight days a week, you know what I mean? But for someone who is underweight, you're not gonna accidentally get, you know, gain 50 pounds back. So you're gonna have to be very intentional about making sure you're, you're adding in some of the more calorie dense foods. I love that and thank you so much. I think it's so interesting the way questions came this time to where yeah. we were talking about gaining weight a little more because usually the conversation goes to losing weight. And I mm -hmm. think it's important just for everyone to kind of see that the McDougal diet is not just for losing weight. It's right. not just for correcting diabetes. It's not just for any one thing. And I, I think sometimes it gets a little pigeonholed maybe. Mm -hmm. 
and, and right. I think it, yeah. And I like that. So, Sir, Sir, I hope that helps a little bit. And it does sound like um, I, that's a prescription I would like. It's to, yeah, eat more. So, I, I was <laughs> just saying, I need a, the <laughs> nurse in me, the nurse in me says, I need to give one more caveat, which is to Sir, Sir. So, um, if you are losing weight with no explanation, you need to go see your doctor. Yes. Okay. If you are losing weight and it makes sense, then you're okay. But if you're losing weight and you're doing everything we're describing about, you know, gaining weight and you're continuing to lose and you're losing out of nowhere and you have no idea why that's concerning. There are, there are a couple things that you would want to have checked out that could be causing that. So you need to go see your doctor. I agree. Oh, I and by saying, the way, Kathy, I can stay as long as you need me. Um, so if you have any more questions today or we can shelve them for next time, you just let me know. Either way is fine with me. Okay. Then I will go ahead and I've been kind of putting off this one, uh, video 1000 nights question about smashed potatoes because I'm like, this is the Stacy hour. This is not the <laughs> Kathy hour. Um, as, uh, for smashed potatoes, and maybe you make them too. Do you, um, do you cut in half or whole? What do you smash them with? Any other subtle details? Do you, where do you bake? Blah, blah, blah. So I like to get the little baby, baby t potatoes. I cook them in the Instant Pot for about six to seven minutes. I let them cool enough and I take a piece of wax paper and smash them on parchment paper. So I smash them onto a big piece of parchment paper because they're gonna stick to everything. It's not gonna be nice. So even with the wax paper, I take like a spatula and then I put that in the air fryer, probably about 410 minutes, probably five minutes. Then I flip it and do another five minutes. You could also put my barbecue seasoning on there or different, you know, chili powder or different things like that. It's all going to stick really easy. I flip them over and then they're super crunchy. If the potatoes are bigger, because you know there's the teeny baby potatoes and then the ones that say baby potatoes that aren't baby potatoes, right? They're like, they're like junior high potatoes. <laughs> Those I cut in half. And usually I cook them whole, cut the, let them cool, cut them in half and do the same thing. Do you have a way you make smashed potatoes? That all sounds perfect to me. I am no culinary expert. I, I mostly will mash them. I do mashed potatoes, but mashed pota any what old I way. Do these four is like sometimes, and sometimes I miss crunchy things. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we, we can't make things that are crunchy, but sometimes it's just not as easily accessible. And so if I'm really wanting something crunchy, if you do that, it's not quite as thin as a potato chip. It's still fairly thin and the edges get really crispy and you've got a little bit of substance in the, in the bottom because they're potatoes with no oil in them. You will get full. They, I believe, I think it was it Dr. Lim or Dr. Lyle. I can't remember now who said it, but was kind of saying, you know, sure, if you air fry your potatoes, they're a little more calorie dense, but that's probably not what's going to, your problem's ever going to be. That was Dr. Right. Lyle. It was Dr. Lyle. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Lyle. And so that's how I look at it. So it does make your potatoes a little more calorie dense, but if I'm just putting smoked paprika on them, I'm not worried. Yeah. I would agree with that, definitely. Also, just remember, I think a couple of times ago when I appeared here, we talked about how, you know, if you get to the point where you're like, I need something crunchy and, and even just a smashed potato isn't quite crunchy enough, go ahead and have a piece of toast or have a some air popped popcorn or something like that. What oftentimes I see, like so often I can't even tell you, is that people like build that craving, crunchy, 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 and they and they just like have amnesia and forget that there's a bunch of food that's McDougal compliant that is totally crunchy that you can have, and instead they just end up in a bag of potato chips. And so don't get yourself to that point of desperation where you can't even remember, you know, that there are healthy options that are crunchy. Yeah, I think air the the 
microwave popcorn thing that we have the glass jar that you just yes. put the kernels in and pops in the microwave. Yeah. I think that explain how we do it. Um, we actually take it's awesome. We somebody else told us about this, and ever since they told us, like we have done it like religiously. Um, we'll put about three. Three tablespoon, two to three tablespoons in the bottom of this. Of pickle juice. Pickle juice. Just from the jar of pickles. And then we put the popcorn in. And this this one, I got this at Ross's too for like $5. And so this has a measuring cup. It's like a third of a cup. And then you put it in the microwave. And it does, it's going to like cook and make, the bottom looks gross. Yeah, but it cleans right it up. Cleans if you, right you up. rinse it out right away, it's not a big deal. But and it adds the salt. It Without gives us saltiness. Any kind of oil. And you don't really get the dill pickle flavor. I kind of wish it was more. So I'm going <laughs> to experiment with putting some things into that. Um, we do it about once a week. Yeah. So, and, and just kind of as a special little treat, and we split that. Um, but even like making fries. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you, I've gone through and made the whole thing start to finish of the fries, like by using them in the cutter and then soaking them and doing this and then I air fry them, obviously. But I will say it's easier and gets a better crunch satisfaction if you just bake a bunch of potatoes, throw them in the fridge for a while, cut them in wedges and air fry them, then you get a really good crunch on it too. Yeah. And, pour some really compliant chili on there. This is one of my favorite winter meals is chili cheese fries, only not. So we take the, we make the wedges a little bit smaller, crisp them up on both sides. I have like my sweet potato black bean chili and I might make some oat queso and put on top. Sounds great. Yeah, somebody yeah. was in the comments was mentioning also like corn tortillas. Like we'll we use those thin credibles that Chef AJ talks about, and um, we'll take those and just cut them into little teeny tiny triangles and put them in the air fryer. And by um, teeny tiny, she means eight pieces. Eight pieces out of that little. <laughs> With not slivers. <laughs> But and yeah, they they totally hit the spot. We had, in fact, we had Mexican yesterday. Yeah, we did refried beans and Ezekiel tortillas. Yes. So it was you know, really good. And again, so now Chris is saying this talk is great. I have CBT two, a rare genetic disc disorder. I can't eat fatty acids. But I can't process fa fatty. Process fatty acids. I've been on a plant-based eating plan, so I found this helps a lot. I'm supposed to eat low-fat, high-carb foods. Oh, yeah, then this is perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect definitely. For you. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Diana was saying the same thing about baking potato, put it in the fridge, and the next day slice it. So a lot of times I'll go ahead and do like four to six potatoes, and I just throw them in there and let them bake in the oven and just do my business and put them in, and then we have them for what I call eating emergencies, which means I went off and did stuff and didn't pay any attention and now I'm hungry. <laughs> I also will not pay attention and go, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so that could be a me problem and not a you problem. But um, but if you, if you have a little ADHD, I think we tend towards, whoops. Yeah. Yeah, and you do that sometimes. She I ate do. a banana, I think, while, I was eating while you banana. were talking because she had I haven't had anything to eat today. And it's Come because on, she's girl. doing too many things. I, I just running around doing stuff. I got up a little late today, so you know, and and having just having some things around can always be helpful too. Mm -hmm. Apples. Yeah, and Dilly was asking about baked tortilla chips is great. And those thin credibles, we actually learned about them from Chef AJ in the McDougal program demo she did. <laughs> and I was like, why are you keeping these from me, <laughs> Chef AJ? Um, let's see what we got here. Janice's question. Yeah, Jan this is a great question. Is it okay to eat one of those McDoodle, <laughs> McDougal? I, I made it all one word. McDougal cup of soups every day. Split pea or black bean. I've been obsessed with them. Should be just fine, yeah. Try uh, try pouring them over a potato or some rice. That makes them even better. The pickle juice. Oh, okay. Sir Sir is asking, and 
Is there a problem with doing the pickle juice more than one time per week? Why do you limit it? We just limit it because it's a dry starch. And we're trying to lose weight. And we're weight. trying to lose weight. So for you, sir, sir, you could do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You could have, you know, and the pickle juice is just a way without, without butter to get a salty flavor. Like I tried making salt water and spraying it. <laughs> it just made the popcorn I tried a, soggy. I tried a whole bunch of different things. Even Bragg, a lot of people use Bragg's. And then it, it was one of you guys yeah. so, that told us this. And once we started doing it, we started with a little bit and we upped it. Yeah. But it's delightful because for me, plain popcorn is, is not delightful. But the trick is, because I found this out the hard way the first time, for the first pickle juice jar we went through, um, if you're using your pickle juice, you also have to be eating your pickles down. Because if you don't, you're using all your juice, and then you're just going to have all these pickles sitting in there with no juice. So now we've been, every time that I do, snack. we have a little exciting. pickle snack every time we're waiting we for the popcorn little, to get ready. And I love pickles, and I never think about eating them. And it's not like we, we're eating a lot of them, but it's just like a very delightful treat to have a pickle sometimes. Yeah. So, um, and Janice, going back to the McDougal cups, you know, so easy to just add boiling water and just wondered if they were considered a dry starch. So maybe talk a little bit about pasta for everybody. Was pasta? she asking about pasta or tortillas? It's no, the like soups. It was the McDougal oh, the soups. Soup. Oh. So, so what I was going back to is I wonder if like when we're talking about wet starches versus dry, because she was wondering if those cups are a dry starch. Right. So this is where the, the language that we use get, breaks down a little bit. So what we're talking about is not wet versus dry. We're talking about water-rich cooked starches. So water-rich cooked starches being rice, corn, quinoa, barley, oatmeal, pasta, the reason why though and i didn't that's not an exhaustive list that's just a few of them but um they are they are water rich so they are cooked or prepared with lots of water and they absorb a lot of water which makes them very low in calorie density dry starches on the other hand are things like bread tortillas um crackers any kind of baked goods pan even if they're 100 percent mcdougal compliant like pancakes or muffins or breads things like that those are your dry starches now jeff novick is always very quick to point out that no it doesn't count if you just take a glass of water and pour it on your piece of bread that's still a dry <laughs> starch that's why he doesn't like the dry versus wet because believe me, we do have people who are like, well, maybe if I moisturize it a little bit, it'll be low in calorie density. And that's not the case. OK, so um, the drier starches, you know, the breads and all that stuff that I just named, those are higher in calorie density. And so you just have to be a little bit more careful with those during the weight loss phase. Now, if you have 100, 150 pounds to lose, you may not have to be careful at all because you're still burning a ton of calories every day just by carrying around your extra weight. And so bread, you may be able to eat bread freely, no problem, just fine, and continue to lose your weight. But when you get lower, like when you have 50, 40, 30 or less or fewer pounds to lose, then you may find that you can't really get away with eating as much bread, crackers, popcorn, those types of things and continue to lose your weight. Okay, that's super helpful. So Stacy can see, you guys can see us, but Stacy can see us looking around. She's like, what are they doing? We have a chipmunk living in the house. And I was like, is the chipmunk back there? Actually, we think we have more than one. Is we, possibly, and I, oh, yeah. no. so every once in a while, if you ever, if we're ever talking, I go, <laughs> you don't know why. Actually, it, it might be Fergus Okay. in the litter but, box. but All right, so let's see. Um, video 1000 Nights, what do you guys think of flax, chia, hemp hearts, or walnuts? Are they important or don't worry? Don't worry. <laughs> and uh, Leanne puts tapioca starch flour in her fries and potatoes when she needs them to get crunchy and it works. That's nice. great. And um, I put this up for everybody else, but I didn't tell you. Janice said, thanks for the clarification. I thought wet starches were basically just 
like the vegetable starch family. So it makes sense now. Oh, and Sir Sir says thanks for all the answers. One person said, can you just spray pickle juice on after? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. What I like is it's like you just made your own flavored popcorn without having any muss and any mm -hmm. cleanup. And like those little spray bottles, the one I put salt water in, I'm still cleaning that thing up. So I would not recommend that. I think well, that's I think all that's of our it. questions. Stacy, you made it through, as always, Yay. brilliantly. Yes. Oh, thanks. It was so to... fun. Thanks for all your questions, everybody. Yeah, and I thought we got, you know, we got into some interesting stuff today, too. Mm -hmm. So this will be a great video for people to reference later as well. Someone mentioned, because I believe some of Dr. McDougall's books are free right now. I think Heather put them on free cool. and I'm, I'm trying to go find them so I can I when I do I'll put the link back over here I've gotten a couple of emails about it as well um, sir sir we were using two to three tablespoons of pickle juice for a third a cup of popcorn everybody else is just saying thank you do you have anything else you want to add Stacy well I think the theme of today was you know, mixing, mi mixing different philosophies and messages and what happens when we do that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say one more time to be so totally clear, there's nothing wrong with it. If you want to try a smoothie regimen for autoimmune illness, or you have cancer or something like that, and there's a reason why you're trying to get those like mega doses of vitamins and nutrients from greens or beans or, you know, uh, berries, those types of things. I'm not going to tell you, you can't do that, or that's not good, or it's not healthy or whatever. But from the McDougal program perspective, we do not prescribe certain amounts of certain foods. We really just want to put the bar super, super duper low, because we find that that's what makes things sustainable for people long term. Most people cannot sustain eating a pound clamshell of greens, you know, twice or three times a day for the rest of their lives and nor should they need to. It's not anything that anyone has ever done. Um, when you look at blue zones, people aren't eating mega doses of vitamins and like massive smoothies with greens and things like that. Um, this is a case where people assume if some, some of something is good, then more must be better. And we just don't know that there's not science that supports that. There's not science that supports that 15 servings of greens a day is better than three or five. So, or two or one. <laughs> so anyway, all of that to say, um, you know, continue to use your beautiful brain that you are equipped with to think rationally through some of these recommendations that are being given to you and think about what's reasonable and what would have been sustainable for humans over the course of human history. And pick a philosophy, pick a doctor that you trust that is a trusted voice and do a trial, do an experiment. Someone asked how long should the experiment be? At least a few weeks, two or three weeks at the least. We usually say most things, if they're going to be helped, will be done within four months. So if you can do it for four months, that'd be great. Um, and of course, if you need medical assistance or medical um, monitoring because you have an illness for which you take medications or anything like that, please come on through the 12-day program. We'll take good care of you and make sure that you get the medical um, care and uh, watchful eye that you need. To, to try to reverse your illnesses. So, so fun being with you guys today. Thanks again so much for having me. Oh, it was awesome. And thanks for like summing everything up like that too, because I think it, it's just easier than you think. True. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to add to Davika. Um, it's not that the air popped popcorn is not compliant. Um, it's a dry starch. Um, so we try to avoid those because we're actively trying to lose weight. So we, st we, we stay away from those dry starches. And also then she was saying no salt added to popcorn, nothing totally plain. The, uh, Dr. McDougall is not a no salt program as is, which I think is kind of a bonus. That doesn't mean if you go in and you have certain um, 
diseases or disorders that Dr. Lim or Dr. McDougall might not put you on that. But as a general rule, yeah. you can have salt, enough salt and sugar to make the food palatable. All right. All right, so definitely going to sign off and let Stacy get on with her day. And we look forward to seeing her the next time. Yeah, yes. we're going to talk about December dates soon. But everybody, thanks so much for hanging out with us. And Stacy, you're just always great. So thank you so much. Thank and you. we'll see you guys soon. Bye, everyone.